Hello and welcome to a bit of a bonus episode of Skein Der Nets. So this is kind of, yeah, the bonus episode of the previous episode. I'm not sure what the difference between a bonus episode and a half episode, like a mini-sode. I've been doing both. Uh, maybe this is a mini-sode. So maybe I should start with the regular introductions, like... My name is Ellie and I am a Norwegian living and knitting in London and you can find me on Instagram as Skeindir and Ravelry as a designer Skeindir Knits and the Ravelry group Skeindir Knits. I can't say Ravelry fast. So yeah, welcome to this uh, weird bonus episode of uh, Skeindir Knits which is where I answer questions that I got on my Instagram when I thought there wasn't going to be enough content for the actual episode. So this is not the usual format. If you want to see the usual format, you probably want to see the previous video. But you're more than welcome to watch this one. It's not going to require any any earlier viewing of anything really. Uh, though, I mean, there might be some insights and stuff here. I don't know what people have been writing me. Okay, there is a considerable portion of questions. I thought I just got five. There is a lot here. Oh dear. <laughs> When did you start to knit and when did it just become madness? I learned to knit when I was about nine, give or take a year, at school. They made us and I didn't like it. I made something awful in like yellow garter. It was supposed to be a headband. It was supposed to be a headband. It was about this long and had more and less stitches than I needed. And it was just really not very nice and I wasn't into it. But luckily they made us knit more and I made a hat and it turned out super tiny because I've always been a tight knitter and I gave it to my newborn cousin who's now nearly 20 years old so yeah I've been knitting for 20 years guys I didn't realize <laughs> revelation I've knitted for 20 years ish ish but yeah that's a bit of a an exaggeration I think it's fair to say I did make a hat and then I tried to make some black book clay leggings at the age of 13 and then school had me make a felted red kind of bowler hat at age 15 I think I wouldn't say any of these projects made me a knitter with a capital K or even a lowercase K uh, it was just school work. It's like saying you're into maths because school made you do maths. That's not quite how it works, I guess. Maybe. I don't know. So I, uh, they made me knit. That's how it started. Even though I did those leg warmers on my own accord, uh, they didn't ever get finished because that's... Why would I finish stuff? <laughs> anyway, I uh, did decide to knit when I was 19, so I would say more than anything I've been a knitter for 10 years. Um, that was when I really decided I am going to knit. I am a knitter now, I will be buying my own yarn and needles, we are going to knit. I was living at this school, it was quite remote, and me and my friends, it was actually more so my friends decided to start knitting. Uh, one of my friends, he decided he wanted to knit himself a rainbow scarf and that is kind of how we kick things off. My other friend who is now living in London and is moving soon after living in the UK with me for years. But she already knew how to knit and taught us, uh, kind of freshed up my memory of it, taught me how to purl, <laughs> things like that. Uh, uh, she's Her name is Christy by the way, she's been on the podcast like last year, year and a half ago. Anyway. We started knitting, it was a lot of garter scarves and and then we advanced to laptop covers, we started felting things. I made a big box that I felted, like a, a basket or something, uh, and I just couldn't have enough. Like I didn't really understand the differences between different yarns. I certainly bought the most affordable around, which is in Norway usually superwash wool, actual wool, and, and I didn't necessarily understand how DK is not the same as Aran and DK isn't the same as fingering because we don't really operate with that terminology in Norway. We talk more about gauge as though a yarn has gauge, which it doesn't, but I didn't understand that at the time. Of course I didn't. I don't think any new knitters would necessarily. Uh, I wouldn't expect so anyway. And uh, there were a lot of uh, awful projects that came through that what I just gave away people said they liked it but who knows where it is now and I eventually advanced and then I decided to take my studies more seriously and there was a lot less knitting happening for about a year or two my first year in London it was actually more crochet than knitting which doesn't sound like me but there you go I did a couple of baskets I think it wasn't really much 
and then I really decided I want to knit because I started to miss Norway so at this time I was maybe like 22 and I kind of wanted to wear some of those things that signal Norwegian abroad which is sort of awful and cringy and cheesy but there you go I wanted a Marius and I wanted a Marius dress and I just did one there wasn't really a pattern for it I tried one but I didn't like it so I just winged it and then I was like I'm really into knitting so there you go, that's how I got into knitting, colour work, garments, uh, designing, construction, modifying, the whole thing. Um, so that was about seven years ago now. So maybe it's more fair to say that I've been a capital K knitter for seven years. Not that you asked for how long, but how long ago, which I guess is the same question, kind of. Yeah, let's move on. I did get some questions from a person asking me to recommend yarns that I don't normally recommend, stuff that you can get at Edinburgh Yarn Festival. And I'm gonna confess I actually haven't checked out the vendor list yet, but if people are interested I can do that in a future video maybe, go through stuff that you can look forward to seeing. But at the same time I'm thinking, you know what, maybe I don't want you to know, maybe I want to get my mitts on it first. I got a question about how to make my mittens larger, such as for a man. Um, for most of my mittens, the sports and the fingering weight ones, I will write it in the pattern, that what gauge you need to get them bigger. But really, I don't expect anyone to swatch for mittens, so this applies to both those mittens and the DK and the heavier weight ones. That is just too big a needle and thicker yarns, right? Just. I'm sure you don't want to swatch any more than I do, so just choose what you kind of think is going to work, right? You could do some maths to guess your gauge and see what size that gauge would be if you got that gauge. Um, there are ways of doing that you can quickly Google, but I do want to generally say you can make any mitten any size. You can make any big mitten into an ornament with finer yarn and needles. You can make any ornament into a man size uh, mitten if you just get thicker yarn and thicker needles. So if you go with my DK weight mittens and turn them into a men's mitten, I don't think you need to go up any heavier than worsted or aran and maybe a needle size or so. It depends how tight you want them as well, how dense you want the, the fabric, um, but there's no modification needed beyond doing that actually. True story. So in a way, any mitten is any size you can just modify that. Sometimes the length isn't going to follow because of the fineness of the yarn will restrict the row gauge and details about that, but then you, that's when you choose thicker yarn. So, or thinner if you want but more row. Anyway, you don't want details, I'm gonna move on. I did get a question about which of my hand-knit sweaters is my favorite at the moment, and I'm going to have to toot my own horn and say, cause of that. I mean, it's just, massively heavy is a proper coat right it smells really sheepy as well and i'm really 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 pleased with it i wear it all the time just it's gotten actually quite a bit warmer now and i'm like you mean i can't wear it anymore it's only february so i'm probably going to be dragging it along with me up to edinburgh just because i can i'm also really really pleased with my thread nearby it's all the teague i also really love Fern and Feather by Jennifer Stangos. I mean, there's a reason they're hanging around here and I'm wearing them because they really are wearable and I do really like them. I also will mention my Winterfjell sweater. I have designed a number of sweaters now, but I will say the Winterfjell is still a, a big favorite of mine. I did make the sweater to be the kind of sweater I just wish yokes were, generally. Tips to knit faster color work. Practice. Sorry, but practice. Memorizable charts, but practice mostly. It's not the most fun answer, but it's the most honest answer I could give. What are some helpful resources regarding pattern designing, especially size grading? I don't really know. Like, I am still learning these things, and sometimes when I don't have the patience to find resources, I just kind of wing it, and I'm like, oh, that works, and... You know, I don't look up the encyclopedia of designing, if there is one. Um, but there are some really good resources out there that I do make use of, even more now than ever before, really. Like, I find the more advanced I become as a designer, the more I use these resources, which I would have thought it was the opposite. But, nah. I think I'm just able to synthesize more things now, and tailoring and size grading and things like that. So, I can really recommend... And this baby, um, 
top down sweaters by Anne Bud. This one has got like tables of numbers for different gauges, different designs. You can use it to design your own things. Uh, I would recommend changing up the numbers of it because you don't want to rip off Anne Bud, who's been making this incredible resource for you, but it is a very good start. Um, it tells you about how to construct basic shapes like raglans, yokes, saddle shoulder. Um, I wonder if that's it. Mm, could could have forgotten some, but it is really good. It was a great start for me when I developed Vintage Fjell and I can recommend it. It can be a bit harder if you want to look outside the box a bit in terms of constructions and look at other things like um, the contiguous shape, for instance. It comes as a free PDF on Ravelry. I think it's Susie Myers, I wonder if that's her name. And that can be a bit hard to understand just reading it, but I'll read it 10 times and it, it will probably be really helpful. And there are also some size grading sources out there. There's one I've forgotten the name of, I'm just gonna put it up here and I'll try to remember to link it down below. And then actually, Isolde's got a size grading chart that she's offered up for free on her blog, so I will try to link to that as well. These are all great resources that I'm happy to share, they're not mine by any means, and yeah, are very helpful once when you want a size grade. Um, in terms of general things, I am still figuring it out. I do not think it is a good idea to learn just from others patterns. It is a great way to understand how it works if you are like me. I often need to knit it to get it. And so if I want to understand, say, how to knit a raglan, if I never done it before, now I have as a bad example. But let's say I want to learn how to. I will be knitting someone else's raglan pattern. But when I want to develop a raglan, I will probably look into books like Anne Bods and I will look into the size charts of the ones I mentioned. So. You can sort of wrap your head around things by knitting others' patterns, but your resources should be the ones that are intended to be resources. So I hope that made sense. Would you be able to discuss any fixes you've made and explain how to? Uh, very often it's cutting into my knitting and knitting more or less, frogging or knitting more, and grafting it together with Kitchener Stitch. That is something I do a lot. I don't care about what direction I'm knitting. If it's just stuck in that, you can change the direction of your knitting. If it was top down, you can change it to bottom up and vice versa. Um, that is how I fix a lot of things. I also am notorious for dropping my stitches on purpose. Like uh, I was knitting something in Garter Ridge the other day and I found that further down I hadn't purled what I was supposed to purl it was knit and I just dropped the relevant stitches down one by one just did one and then nested it back up how it should have been with a crochet hook and then did the next stitch the same way and then yeah I've done that a lot with the the sword it card again there's a lot of cables there that I got wrong and I will essentially drop all the stitches and cable it as the floats are just kind of the yarns just hanging in there and kind of work up those rows within that relevant section. It requires being able to read your knitting, but it's also what is going to give you the skill of reading your knitting. So it's definitely something I can recommend, even though the first couple of times you're doing it, it will take a long time and you will make mistakes and you'll have to do it a lot of times, but it's a worthwhile skill to have. I don't really believe so much in blocking things to shape and size because the yarn tends to snap back to where it wants to be. So I do believe in directly interfering with the knitting instead. Can you stay after Brexit? I don't know, you tell me. Some people are like, of course you can, it's not gonna be like that. But then again, you know, nobody would have thought it would have been like this. So uh, I have no idea. I'd like to think that I can. What I guess will happen is that as long as I've stayed here for a certain number of years, I will have residency, which I currently supposedly have as a matter of principle for having lived here for this long, seven and a half years, I think. Um, but what I fear is going to change is that as soon as I decide to move, I will not as easily be able to move back despite having lived here for seven and a half years. Um, and I also don't know if my residency covers places like Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland. And I would very much like to move to Scotland at some point. So if I then have to like apply for a visa or whatever I will have to do, I'm not sure. The thing that makes this a bit complicated for Norwegians in particular is that we are not in the EU ourselves. We are in the EEA. So 
that relies on the EU wanting to allow the UK to negotiate with the EA or an EA country. So it depends what Britain decides to do, which we don't yet know. Um, I hope I'm going to be allowed to stay here for as long as I wish. I hope I'm going to be free to move to Scotland, but you can't, you can't really guarantee anything at this point. It's all up in the air. It's a little bit stressful. I'm like, I finished my PhD in time. I started a business in, the, in this country. I've got money in this currency. What? Anyway, that was a bummer. Let's move on. Someone's asked me if I want to design something in color work and cables. I haven't planned to do that. I don't think I will do it in the near future. I am enjoying the Nordilon hat that I showed you in the video episode before last, I think. Um, but it does take a lot longer. And it's a shame to say it, but often I, I kind of hesitate to develop more advanced designs even though that's what really gets me excited because I'm like oh my days imagine all the pattern support questions from people who've never done it before I just want to go and hide <laughs> the thing is I don't even get that many pattern support questions but the more unusual a method is for someone the more questions you get no matter how clear you are because people often aren't very confident with the things that they have less experience with and so if i make a pattern in a way that has say color work and cable something i would argue most people have no experience a little experience with i will be basically putting myself out there for getting more emails which is basically going to be along the lines of i have read this in the pattern is that what you really mean and i'm like yeah it is <laughs> yeah <clears throat> so yeah uh that's not really the answer to your question but i always digress so i hope you enjoy that <laughs> which jumpers or cardigans have you knit using horse yarn and do you hold it double i only hold it double if i want a dk to worsted weight possibly even aran but i don't hold it double for fingering to sport weight sweater i get questions about this a lot and i would do want to put in there not to this person but in general I am not whole support, okay? I get a lot of whole support type questions, which is like, I can't wash out the oil. How much do I wash it to make it bloom? How much bloom can I expect, huh? And people are like, oh, you recommended it for your sweater, but are you sure you're not holding it double? It seems awfully t thin. And I'm like, it is as it says. Uh, if you've got questions for holst, then ask holst. Um, but this question was, of course, for me. I'm not. I'm just. I take. I'm taking the opportunity to just say that this question is absolutely fine. Uh, I just thought I'd digress again. But yeah, I have made lots of garments in holst. I made um, this particular one, the, the after party from Lane Magazine issue six by Astri something. I can't remember names. I made this uh, fern and feather. That was when I held it double because it calls for a worsted weight. I have made the flea card again, Dalmiaka Loppa, if you will. I have I made other things. I think I made a lot of things that have been frogged. I am working on a really spectacular card again that I hope to have finished for Edinburgh Yarn Festival. I'm going to show you that because I've got it right here, so why not? This cardigan is a mixture of yarns like Hull Super Soft and those that are pretty much just like it. I love this thing so much. I really want to have it done for Edinburgh because it's going to be very light and not too hot to wear there. Uh, it's just a matter of really getting through the sleeves, which I didn't really enjoy because there was a lot of ends to weave in. Whereas for the body, I could just chuck them into the steek and just cut those ends right off when I get to it. So not that many garments in holst as you might think but there will be more i do have a lot of holst yarn and i absolutely love it it's not the strongest yarn in the world um i'm not it doesn't break easily or anything like that but you're not gonna make the sturdiest garments in the world for that i would go with something a bit more robust like phenol or usk but if you want so phenol usk type yarns but a lot lighter then whole super soft is and affordable but thin is already affordable it's, just, it's not the question you asked <laughs> so yeah that cardigan was held single it's a fingering weight cardigan it's got the same gauge as um this sweater actually this is not whole super soft it's jc rennie super soft which is nearly identical also a 24 stitch gauge held single not double 
um, I wouldn't say it's particularly see-through. I mean, it's, it is when I stretch it. Now I'm stretching it quite with a lot of force. So when you don't, it's not see-through because it's been washed and I've not had much luck washing out the oil without the machine. I would recommend trying to figure out your washing machine using a wool wash soap and avoiding friction and any temperature above 30. So I did get a question about which designers that have big range in sizes and uh, this person has trouble finding small enough sizes and I do know there are a lot of people who struggle to find large enough sizes. Uh, I can't think of any big number of designers off the top of my head. I do know that Spindles and Stitches has made a, a stories series in her on her Instagram account, on her highlight story stories highlight. So you can go and check that out over there. But this is one of the things that me and Amy talked about bringing up on our Instagram live streams that I mentioned in the main episode. Um, so if there's anything more about that you want us to mention, if you want to suggest any designers with a broad size range that you want us to mention, both on the smaller end and the larger end of the scale, then do let us know and we will have a think about that. How do you get your bangs so perfect? I love them. Well, I'm sure there's a very broad uh, audience who are really keen to know this, but I'm going to mention it anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I wash it. I try to wash my hair less and less so that it's not going to get super oily because it has a tendency to get very oily. My bangs, fringe, what have you, in particular, gets very oily very easily. And the way I avoid that is as soon as I washed my hair, I dry shampoo my fringe. So I'll just spray it full of big sexy hair dry shampoo, that's what it's called. This is the best one I've ever tried. Um, unfortunately not as easy to get in the UK as in the US certainly not for a decent price so I tend to hoard when I'm overseas and it doesn't leave as much white dust as many other dry shampoos do and doesn't seem to in harm my hair in any particular way and it leaves it sort of voluminous and bouncy and it doesn't yeah it will usually start splitting up and looking quite thin and shiny and oily eventually. At the end of the day, when it, will, it will even be quite oily if I don't use the dry shampoo. So that's my secret. Yes, I'd love to hear about your color work design process. Do you chart first or swatch and see? I tend to open up Excel and start charting there. I will rarely swatch I tend to just chart in Excel and cast on and if it doesn't work well then I wasted a lot of time but luckily for me it usually works out well every time so yeah I tend to just draw in Excel I will start making some kind of yeah pixel art if you will and then take a break and look at it later and see does it look like anything you know like when I made the Sylvester mittens for instance the ones that I had released with loop I was not sure if all those teeny animals here and there were going to look like anything like you know can you see the dragonflies it's clear that that's a bird you know uh so that's kind of what i do i will start charting in excel i tend to know my stitch count already based on the gauge i will try to achieve and as soon as i have that ready i will start casting on and i tend to do the extra right above the pattern a bit later especially when it comes to mittens but if I'm doing a garment that tends to be written and graded before I cast on um, at least graded so that I know that what I'm doing for my size is gradable at all are you considering going to Oslo Knitting Festival in the autumn or TRD Trondheim Knit also in the autumn I would love to I really want to I don't know if I can but I will aim to um, I really Oh my god, I want to. Every time uh, the TRD or Trondheim uh, wool fest has happened, I have had massive, massive FOMO. The one thing that could get in the, in the way is if I am gonna have my PhD viva then, depending on how much I write, which I should be doing right now, but here we are. Um, it may all come down this autumn, you know, it may all be happening then, and I'd love to go to Oslo, to Trondheim, both the knitting festivals. Um, I'd love to do a talk there as well actually. If anyone wants me to have a talk just let me know. I also want to go to Bergen again. I love that festival so much. I am hoping to do another Oslo thing that I don't know exactly the details of right now. Uh, 
basically I should just move to Norway again. <laughs> I really want to but like I said the PhD is likely to get in the way and I would also really love to go to Rhinebeck. I have never been to Rhinebeck. I get massive FOMO every year, you know, fear of missing out. Uh, but I don't, I am even afraid of planning that because I don't know when I'm likely to finish my PhD and when they would want me to have my Viva. So it's just all up in the air right now. I'd love to be able to say for sure, but all I can say is that I really want to. How many designs are you currently working on? I have no idea. How many am I working on? I've got the shawl and the cardigan finished. They're ready to come out. Uh, I should finish those socks. Um, uh, there are two garments on the needles that I'd like to have finished as designs. There are a lot of designs I need to start making from scratch because I've been asked to do so and so from here and there. Um, it's probably about 10, maybe. And I need to start designing mittens again for the coming autumn. Yeah. This is when it all starts again. You think you're done by the end of the year and then it just starts again. <laughs> when and where do you draw the line between inspired by and I made a new design? I think that's a really good question and especially if you're like me and you're like kind of very traditional inspired. I think you can really draw the line, um, first of all, the one that you got inspired from. Are they still alive? Are they still profiting from it? Is it still within there or someone else's copyright or intellectual property or at least you know it's got someone's name on it that you are paying when you buy it um so that will be the marius for instance that belongs to someone they own that pattern that design uh you can discuss these things legally and it's a little bit so and so but uh, as a whole um but the set the star is not the case the set the star that the marius is inspired from the the black and white design um nobody owns that i can be inspired by that anyone can be that Sadly mittens as well like yeah sure the big wool companies in norway do them but nobody owns them and that is a big factor the other so like if i got inspired by oh i don't know a hohi locatelli pattern she's still a designer who is still active and her designs are very much hers and if I got inspired by them, that would be a little bit dodgy. So that is definitely a place I draw the line. Are they, you know, is it attached to a certain person and are they still in business? And yeah, but if it's more of a heritage thing, it becomes quite different Then nobody really owns it. And then you have to consider, is it yours then, you know, is it the general public or can you make a version that is yours? And that relies on your designer skills, your construction skills, your ability to do uh, the maths of stitch count, of gauge, of writing a pattern, of course knitting it, um, and making a composition that whilst inspired is still something you feel truly is yours. So I need to be able to look at it and recognize it as mine. I can see in an instant if someone's knitted any of my mittens. I can see if it's mine or if it's uh, from a big publisher or something someone made up. I can immediately recognize it. I did have someone actually um, basically steal my pattern and rechart it. And I saw it immediately that it was mine. It had nothing to do with Sarva mittens anymore. But I recognized my construction, my... The dimensions and everything like that so i think if you are a designer you will probably already know the answer to this because a designer will always recognize their work so that's kind of where i draw the line there you don't necessarily it's like i said earlier as well if you want to have a resource you know like the Anne bud book that is your resource a pattern is not a resource is there a color that you never knitted with and why i don't know if there are that many pastels I don't know if I'd do pastels, but then pastels have a place in color work with starker colors to be balanced out. I don't know if there's any color that's off the table, depending on how it's used and what it's used with, but you will never find me use just pastel. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a pastel gal. Do you see your future in London or Norway? I have no idea. This is a question that kind of stresses me out a lot. Not that you stress me out, but like in general, I'm like, I have no idea where my future is. I thought it was here. I thought it was in the UK. There's a lot of things that have come up that are like, okay, maybe it isn't, but then where? I think if I moved back to Norway, I would be bored out of my brains. I feel so much more connected with the world living here and like actually 
living in a, a world metropole, so to speak, and being able to find, I mean, there are like meetups for every hobby or interest or topic or what have you under the sun. If I move back to Norway, I'd be like, oh yeah, I'd like to meet a society for that and it won't exist. Uh, and that kind of thing mean, makes me really enjoy being here. But it's also way too busy for my liking. I think it's just super hectic and it's just expensive. I don't want to live in a flat share. I want to live on my own. I want to be able to afford that. Um, so maybe the answer is somewhere a bit remote in the UK. But then again, I just, what, we, what would I be doing out there? You know, then I might as well be in Norway. So I am kind of thinking right now that maybe Scotland is the answer. It seems to be a happy middle ground. Um, as long as I can find a house that is somewhat insulated. You know how I feel about insulation, you guys. It's proper insulation. It's in the north. I mean, pretty knitted hems and edges. Well, there is a book for that. Knitting on the Edge. This is actually a series of books, but I will say I think the first one is the one with the best edges. I'm not sure if it's directly about hems, but it's just any way you can finish off your knitting. I haven't really made as much use of this book as perhaps I should, but it's a fabulous resource to, resource to find edgings and hems and cast-offs and such for your knitted items. Favourite non-knitting book? I'm probably gonna forget a lot of books that I like. Now I'm gonna try to come up with them just off the top of my head. I, for some reason, the first that hit my mind was the Mistborn book, the first one, The Last Empire, which sounds like it will be the last book, but it's the first book. It starts off where most books uh, don't end, which is the villain has taken over and they won and they have world power. Now what? Uh, which is a pretty refreshing way to build up a story. Uh, and set things off and such so that's I think the reason I just thought of that is because I'm still on book two so I also really enjoyed Hyperion by Dan Simmons although there's like so many cringy things in it I don't know why I thought it was great but I really enjoyed it for like the time warp stuff and yeah I love the Stieg Larsson books the one with the uh, Lisbeth Salander and stuff like that oh, they're amazing uh only the ones that he wrote they are the only books that are canon I feel quite strongly about this I love anything written by Astrid Lindgren, even though she's a child, children's author. Uh, those books, they formed me, they made me who I am, and I am forever grateful. Uh, which other books are there? I love the Lunar Chronicles. Yes, you will find them on the same shelf that has books like, I don't know, Twilight or whatever, which I don't really care for. But I really like the Lunar Chronicles. They are a perfect mishmash of fairy tales and sci-fi. It's very, like, young adult and stuff, but I, I really do enjoy them. I am also looking up at the Handy Woman book by Kate Davies, which reminds me I really do want to pick up that book and read it soon. I love reading autobiographies, that's one of my favourite genres. Um, I loved reading like psychology autobiographies when I was in my late teens. I think my favourite was An Unquiet Mind by Kay Redfield. Okay. It used to be my favourite book, but now I've forgotten it. It was way too heavy reading for a 17-year-old, but I loved it. Um, I also really loved the book Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow by Daniel Kahneman. It's a very sort of dry psychology book, uh, more so related to my research area. Not quite, but sort of. I can really recommend that if you're curious about decision-making psychology. I've probably forgotten, like, the most obvious favourite book of mine. Um, Oh yeah, there's some Norwegian books that unfortunately none of you can read at the time being, but hopefully they will be translated. And that is Ravneringene uh, by C.D. Pettersen and A Song for Ada Boo. These are both great fantasy series. I just love them. So that's it. No more questions here. And so that's my Q&A bonus episode. Thank you all so much for watching. I'm very sorry for those of you who are still posting questions after I've done recording. Uh, I need to get on with my day and it's getting dark, so. Oh dear. But yeah, like I said, thank you all so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye.